Yes, it so, is. <laughs> so why did you buck that conventional wisdom and start a company in 2006? Well, I mean, I think that uh, everybody, people still consume music in the sense that the issue is more the delivery method, you know? I mean, it's not so much that record labels and artists don't have a future. It's how do people get their music? How do they get access to the music? So one method currently is through the physical CD product. But, uh, you know, people who are involved in the music industry are now figuring out other ways in which to generate revenue from music. You know, there's other ways. I mean, certainly downloads have become an increased, mm -hmm. increasing revenue stream. Um, there's, you know, involvement in other aspects of the artist's career um, that can help generate revenue. And, you know, the reality is CDs are going to be around forever or for a long, long time, maybe not forever. It's just that there will be other options, there will be other ways for people to get music. And uh, so it's actually a really interesting and exciting time to start a record label. It has its challenges, but it also has its opportunities to take advantage of now. So starting a new label that's able to experiment and explore these directions that isn't stuck in its ways um, is actually really great. It's an opportune moment. Well, and indeed, you have been recognized. So you took off, you've got, um, what, five? Um, five releases five re so far, Five yeah. releases so far, another one soon to come. You've just returned from the annual World Music Expo in mm -hmm. Spain, where Cumbancha received the number two label of the year. It's barely been in business for a year. Right. Also, your artist, um, Andy Pal Palacios' Cumbancha album, was selected as the World Music Album of the Year. Um, he won the Womex, which is the, the award from that. Um, and, and I guess that, that also Andy's, uh, this CD has won many, many albums of the year from yeah. all over the yeah, world. Yeah, it's one of the most highly praised records of the year, and, and deservingly so. I mean, it's a great record, and it's an incredible story and project. And I think, you know, all of the records that I put out, you know, I, they're, they're about the music, but they're also about the story, you know? There's so much mm -hmm. about what is it about that artist that's compelling to people? I mean, obviously the music is the thing that's going to attract you, but um, people are also interested in the stories behind the music and the stories about the artists, and so that's something I really pay attention to. And, and yeah, it's been an incredible first year and a half for the label. Yeah. I, I mean, I was at Womax and it was like, everybody was coming up to me like, uh, where did you come from? <laughs> but you know, I mean, the reality is I've been doing well, this you, for a long time. Sure. And my job at Putumayo has enabled me to connect with such a wide array of artists and, uh, and to really have my fingers on the pulse of so many different things that this is like a champagne bottle uncorking. I mean, all of this stuff has been building up for mm -hmm. years. And mm -hmm. so, um, and I, I want to do more. I mean, at this point, my challenge is limiting, you know, keeping control of myself and making sure that I don't uh, try to do more than I can actually take on. I well, I, I was wondering, will that shift the way you do business with that kind of recognition? We could all hope for it, but few people get it so quickly. Yeah. Well, I mean, it definitely sets you up for, uh, you know, having to top it the next year. I'm shooting for number one label of the year next well, of year. Course. <laughs> so, and what does kumbancha mean? Kumbancha is an Afro-Cuban word, and Cuban music was always my particular area of interest. Mm -hmm. That's what I wrote my master's thesis on. And, uh, you know, it's a West African der derivation, but a kumbancha is basically uh, when Friends come over to your house, they have a bottle of rum, you pull out your guitar, your drums, you start playing music, drinking, partying, having a good time, and the next thing you know, it's five in the morning, that's a kumbancha. And um, I just like the community aspect of the name. Um, I like that it was a little mysterious, that people won't know what it is. And also, uh, just that it's multicultural, it has different elements, it has Spanish roots and African yeah, roots, and that's uh, great. So sort of summed it up. So you, you've lived in LA, San Francisco, Amsterdam, Iceland, New York. Why did you choose to bring your family back to Vermont? Well, you know, I think like many people who grow up in Vermont, we, we often leave, most of my friends left, and went off into the world. And, uh, but we always had in the back of our mind, no, someday I'll move back to Vermont. And you know, some of us think, I'll move back when I retire, you know, or I'll move back when I have a family or, or whatever. I think there's a lot of people who really love living in Vermont. And, uh, you know, we'd always had it in the back of our mind. It didn't come to fruition because I was so busy, you know, we were all so busy out in the world doing other things. But, um, you know, uh, things happened in our life. We'd moved back from Europe. We were in New York. We'd sort of outgrown New York. And we came up to visit my mother, who lives in Burlington. And uh, a friend of my mother's, who is a local musician, said, you know, you guys should move to Vermont. And I know just the place that you should buy, the, you know. 
And she introduced me to Charles Eller, who owns uh, Charles Eller Studios in Charlotte. Sure. And uh, I was like, well, I don't, I don't want to live in Charlotte. You know, I'm from Central <laughs> Vermont. That's the other side of the hill. But all right, I'll go check it out. And so I went down there. And uh, I met Chuck, and my wife and I went down there. And uh, you know, we just drove up to the house. We are like, oh, ooh, this is nice. And then Chuck showed us around the studio. He has an amazing recording studio that's been mm -hmm. there for 15 years. And uh, you know, he was looking for a way to keep the studio running and, and keep uh, the business going, but also for him to free himself up to do some other things that he wants to do, he wants to spend more time. Uh, in, uh, in Mexico where he has another house and um, I at that moment was just deciding what to do with my future and uh, wanted to be more involved in, in the production side of things so I said well hey this is perfect you know, it was a great serendipitous opportunity so that meeting was was part of the motivation now to come up here it just seemed right. like uh, it was meant to be and it's working so far it's great yeah, yeah. terrific yeah. Um, uh, among dozens of, of Putumayo compilations, there are at least a dozen about kids, which, right. which I think is so, and, and I wonder with, with your kids if you even started that, but maybe it was started before. No, 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 it started, it started when I was at Putumayo, yeah. and it started right after my first daughter was wow. born, so it was, it was magical. I mean, you know, over the years, Putumayo, everybody had said, we play your albums for our kids, blah, blah, blah. We knew that we wanted to move into the kids' world, and so we, we did an album called World Playground back in either 2000, I think it was. And it was our first kids' record, and it's gone on to become one of the biggest-selling Putumayo records of, of the company's right. history. And you have about a dozen now. What, yeah, yeah. So, so what, it, what do children learn from the exposure of, of uh, world music? I mean, these are just two of them, and, and the graphics, of, of course, are great for the kids' yeah. stuff, too. But what, what is it that really works for kids with well, these compilations? Well, I mean, it's, uh, it's just an incredible uh, way for children to expand their exposure to other cultures mm -hmm. and languages and other styles of music. I mean, uh, my children and, and many children, you know, they might not necessarily listen to, to uh, uh, Celtic music or African music or Brazilian music or whatever, but we put it in a, in a very appealing way, you know, with lots of approachable information. Mm -hmm. You know, we try not to make them too pedantic, but the underlying concept has also been make them something that your parents the parents and the children can enjoy together, not a kid's album that is Barney that you're like, oh, please take it off. Right. It's something that, you know, as many parents buy these again to enjoy. And again, again and yes, again, Yes, because right? that's what happens. <laughs> I mean, I myself have listened to Dreamland, the Putumayo Lullaby CD, probably 400,000 times because right. it's the record that goes on for the kids when they go to sleep. And, um, and they're magical, you know? I mean, it's a really wonderful privilege and, and to be involved with something that you know is helping uh, a new generation learn about the diversity of the world. And language isn't a problem, either for adults or kids, really. No. Is it I ever mean, a barrier? No. Kids appreciate music on its own terms. You know, sometimes the songs are in English, sometimes they're in other languages, and uh, you know, they sing along. I mean, they sing along to the songs without knowing what the songs are about, even, and then they can learn what the songs are about and learn something from them. And so it's really a, it's a, a great, great project. I was very moved um, when I saw the CD from uh, your Idan Rachel mm -hmm. project. Um, and I'd like to show a piece of that and talk about how far music can go in supporting kind of the lofty ideals of global understanding and peace in, in this, the, the audience's mix, the, the performers are such a wonderful mix, they are yeah. traditional instruments. So talk to us a little bit about, you know, how far can we go with this? Well, I mean, I first started hearing about the Idan Reichel project through people out in the world who said, you know, there's this group in Israel that you should know about, and they kept sending me information. So I got in touch with them. And um, <clears throat> the story is just amazing. I mean, basically, Idan is a young Israeli musician, has big, long dreadlocks. He's really right. attractive. He's fellow. actually the keyboard player. Yeah, he's we'll the see keyboard in a player. And um, he was just living in a very multicultural Tel Aviv in Israel, you know, where there were immigrants from Ethiopia. There's a big Ethiopian Jewish community. Um, he was working with Palestinian musicians. He was basically just an open-minded musical explorer, working with people of all generations, you know, old, you know, very old musicians, kids, and, uh, you know, young, hip mm -hmm. people. And he put together this record that became an overnight and unbelievable, unprecedented phenomenon in Israel. And so I went to see him perform. He came to New York and played, you know, primarily for the Israeli community in New York. And I was like, oh, I'll go check it out. And it was in a church. 
in, uh, in near Columbia University. It was a benefit concert for the Pakistan Earthquake Relief Fund, and the ambassador from Pakistan was mm. there. Mm. And it was all filled with young, sort of politically progressive Israelis who.